Hey everyone, this is Matthew Kent with FlightTrajectory.com. I know it's been a while since I've made a lesson, um, and I apologize for that. Just gotten busy with everything in life going on. Um, but without further ado, here's lesson three. Now you can't really talk about airplanes and flying in flight simulators without talking about some aerodynamics. That's what I'm going to cover in this video. Um, the first topic that I want to talk about is the four forces of flight that act on an airplane. Um, looking at this picture here of the airplane, um, the first force is lift, and opposing lift is the weight of the airplane itself, and then providing forward momentum is thrust provided by the engine and the propeller, and opposing thrust is drag. Now when you're looking at these four forces, you have to think of them in terms of acceleration. Um, for example, an airplane um, that's in straight and level flight, unaccelerated, it's said that lift is equal to weight and the thrust is equal to the drag. Um, now again, that's in terms of acceleration. So here's an example. If you were to push in the throttle, the airplane is going to start accelerating. And while it's accelerating, thrust is going to be greater than drag. But as the plane accelerates, the drag is going to increase um, just because you have more air resistance against the plane itself. And as that happens, um, it'll slowly reach in equilibrium again where thrust equals drag. If you pull the power back, drag is going to be greater than thrust and the airplane is going to slow down. And eventually it'll slow down and then it'll reach um, a certain point where thrust and drag are equal again and it's no longer accelerating and it's in steady state flight again. And again, if the airplane is not climbing or descending, then lift is going to be equal to weight. Now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about lift and how lift is generated uh, and it pretty much all comes down to Bernoulli's principle. Here's a picture of a cross-cut section of the wing. So basically if you were to look at the end of the wing, this is what it would look like. Um, you can see that the bottom surface of the wing is flat and the top surface of it has uh, is curved. It basically it has a camber is what we call it. Um, now imagine that two molecules are uh, f floating side by side holding hands and they meet the front edge of the wing and uh, one says to the other, hey I'll meet you over on the other side. Now for them to meet on the back edge of the wing, the trailing edge of the wing, at the same time the molecule on the top has to go faster because it has more distance to travel than the molecule on the bottom. Um, so back to Bernoulli's principle says that as you increase the velocity of a fluid that its internal pressure decreases. So what this actually does is create low pressure on top of the wing um, whereas the bottom of the wing has a higher pressure and that's what creates lift. So here's quick and easy proof that Bernoulli's principle works. Now remember that as we increase the velocity of a fluid, its pressure decreases. So if you take a piece of paper and hold it like this and then blow on top of the piece of paper, not underneath it, but blow on top of the piece of paper, what that's doing is, is increasing the velocity of the air, thereby creating the low pressure which is going to suck the paper up. And I'll turn to the side so you can see it from here too. That you can see I'm not blowing underneath of it. I'm blowing on top of the piece of paper and it's sucking it up because the increased velocity creates lower pressure. I also want to talk about a few terms that we're going to use talking about the wing here. Um, the first one I already mentioned is the leading edge of the wing. That's obviously the front edge. And then the back edge of the wing is called the trailing edge. Um, the next term is called the cord line. Uh, if we were to draw a line from the middle of the leading edge all the way back to the trailing edge, that's called the cord line of the wing. Now, what we're actually doing whenever we move a flight control, be it the ailerons, the elevator, or the rudder, you're actually changing the cord line of the wing. Um, and what will happen is if, we, uh, if one aileron goes down, that's going to change the cord line so that there's a greater camber on the top of the wing, thereby creating lower pressure, thereby creating more lift. If we put an aileron up, that's actually going to lessen the cord line in the camber of the wing, creating um, higher pressure on the top and lower pressure on the bottom of the wing. 
The next term we need to understand is angle of attack. Now angle of attack is the angle between the chord line of the wing and the direction of the relative wind, which is another term. Uh, the relative wind is the airflow that's exactly parallel and opposite to the flight path of the airplane. So for instance, if we're in straight and level flight, we're just flying straight forward, uh, the relative wind is going to be exactly opposite of that. Now if we're in a descent, then our flight path is at a downward angle and the relative wind is going to be directly opposite to that. Now the thing to understand here is that it's the angle between the wing of the airplane, between that chord line and the relative wind, not the attitude of the airplane. So for instance, we can be, the airplane can be in a level attitude, which basically talking about the horizon, it's parallel, the fuselage of the airplane is parallel with the horizon. However, the plane can be descending. So in this case, this is what our angle of attack is going to look like. So the biggest thing to remember is that it's the angle between the chord line of the plane and the relative wind. And that, that can be completely separate from the attitude of the airplane. So just because you're in, your attitude is level with the horizon doesn't mean that you can't be descending. Another thing to understand without going into too much detail about it is that lift, among other things, is a function of airspeed and angle of attack. So if we have a given airspeed, as we increase the angle of attack, our lift is going to increase. Um, and as the lift increases, the center of lift, basically the point where that lift is considered to be concentrated, it moves forward on the wing. And as we reduce the angle of attack for that same given airspeed, our lift is going to decrease and the center of lift moves aft on the wing. Also, for a set angle of attack, as we accelerate and airspeed increases, lift is going to increase. And for that same given angle of attack, as we decrease our airspeed, our lift is going to decrease as well. And the same thing applies that as the lift increases or decreases, as lift increases, the center of lift moves forward. As lift decreases, the center of lift moves aft. Now this gives us enough information to talk about stalls. And anytime we talk about stalls with aviation, it's going to be talking about an aerodynamic stall, not about an engine stalling. Um, so a stall basically occurs when the airflow separates from the top portion of the wing. Um, so what happens is as you increase the angle of attack of the wing, the airflow has a hard time flowing over the wing and, stay and, and maintain that smooth airflow. It will start to separate at the trailing edge of the wing and work its way forward. And once that airflow separation reaches a certain point, and usually it's about around a 17 degree angle of attack, um, right around that 17 degree angle of attack, the uh, wing can no longer produce any lift because the airflow is separated from it. At that point in time the wing basically ceases to fly and you start dropping out of the sky. Um, now to recover from a stall if you push the nose forward and reduce that angle of attack what that's going to do is re reattach the airflow to the wing and it'll start producing lift again. And in one of my future lessons I'm going to uh, show you guys what a stall looks like in Flight Simulator. The next thing I want to talk about is drag. Now there's basically two types of drag. There's parasite drag and induced drag. Parasite drag is basically anything on the plane that interferes with the airflow, anything non-aerodynamic. So um, you have wing struts, that's going to create drag. Your landing gear struts, uh, chips in the paint, scratches in the paint, dings and dents in the airplane, all of that is going to create drag. Um, antennas sticking up, that all creates drag. Uh, in parasite drag, the faster you go, the more parasite drag increases, which earlier when I was talking about thrust and drag, that's why when you push in the power, the plane starts to accelerate, but as you're accelerating, that parasite drag is increasing until a point where the thrust and the drag are equal again. Now, induced drag is basically aerodynamic drag, uh, and there's more or less two components to it. Um, the first is wingtip vortices. Looking again at the uh, 
picture of the wing, remember that we have low pressure on top of the wing and high pressure underneath of the wing. Now that high pressure wants to meet the low pressure and equal out. So the only place for it to do that is at the tip of the wing. So the uh, high pressure from underneath the wing comes up and over and spills out over the top of the wing and creates these wingtip vortices. Now what actually happens because of those wingtip vortices is that they create an increase in downwash behind the wing which has the same effect as creating um, a relative wind near the wing that's actually directed a little bit downward and rearward. Now one of the things about lift is that it always acts perpendicular to the average relative wind. So because now we have this new average relative wind that's directed slightly downward and rearward, what that's doing is creating a rearward component of lift. So our lift that's supposed to be helping us up, and a portion of that is actually directed rearward, which is creating drag. Now unlike parasite drag, induced drag actually decreases the faster we go. So the slower we are, the more induced drag we have, but the less parasitic drag we have. And the faster we go, the less induced drag we have, but the greater parasitic drag we have. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is ground effect. Um, ground effect is actually a reduction of drag that happens as a result of the airplane flying close to the ground. Uh, and basically, you'll notice this in Flight Simulator for sure, the closer you are to the ground, the less um, pronounced the effects of induced drag are. Um, and you can feel it up to within one wingspan, basically one wingspan of the airplane. At the height of one wingspan above the ground, uh, you can no longer feel the effects of ground effect. If you try and lift off too soon, um, the plane actually will start to climb out um, because of the reduced induced drag. But as you climb out and get above around a half a wingspan or so, and those results of ground effect uh, start to diminish, the plane's going to sink back to the ground and you'll have trouble lifting off. Um, now, what you can actually do, you can lift off the ground and stay really close to the ground so your wheels aren't touching but you stay in that ground effect and you can build up your airspeed in ground effect and you have less of a penalty due to induced drag uh, you can build up your airspeed that way and then lift off once you've built up sufficient airspeed and that's another thing I'll be covering in a later lesson on soft field takeoffs it's a technique uh, that you can use to get off of grass strips well, that's all for this lesson. Um, the next lesson I'll probably spend uh, in Flight Simulator showing you guys some stalls and some other things like that. Uh, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, please leave me comments and subscribe to my channel.